The purpose of this paper is to suggest a re-evaluation of general semantics tools set against a contemporary con communications environment. So I'd like to start by sharing a painting I revisited in a gallery near me just after lockdown um, started to ease. So there might be a little bit of delay when I'm changing the slides, but just bear with me. Um, so this painting is called A Panic. It's a huge painting made by a Victorian artist called Henry William Banks Davis in 1872. I think you'll find it's a very moving piece. Um, I'll give you a few seconds just to, to have a look. Um, the painting came back into my mind for a number of reasons. Firstly, the title of Panic is similar to Pandemic, both words of different roots. Pandemic coming from pandemos, meaning all people, whilst Panic relates to the god Pan, who is half goat, half man, and is noted for causing irrational fear. It's this sense of fear that I find illustrated in this painting and reconnecting with this work in 2020 amplified this characteristic for me. So let's have a closer look. The panic is just breaking. We're left to speculate upon its source. We only see an instant, an, in, an intensely charged moment where something has just happened. The spread of the panic is starting to travel through the herd. If we could see that the herd was stirring because of a group of huntsmen on horseback approaching, then we'd perhaps feel that the fear is justified. But we see the panic spreading through, um, through the masterful way in which Davis has expressed the, the reactions of the cattle, especially in their eyes, most of which look out to us. Uh, this compositional technique connects us with a sort of empathic thread uh, to the painting. Uh, we find a reaction of acute panic depicted in the black and white cow uh, where the white of the eyes is exposed in fear. The panic is spreading through the herd mentality. The cows begin to react as a unit. Their behaviour becomes based upon the other cows' responses and actions to an unknown source. In the face of the unprecedented, we are acutely aware of others' reactions. And in this light, I saw Banks Davis's painting as a study of reactions. Korzybski's definition of semantic reactions in Science and Sanity reads, the working tool of psychophysiology is found in the semantic reaction. This can be described as the psychological reaction of a given individual to words and language and other symbols and events in connection with their meanings. So semantic reactions are not simply good or bad, but exist on a spectrum. The tools and methods of general semantics offer practical methods to help us filter out more harmful tendencies in our semantic reactions. We cannot judge the appropriateness of the cow's reactions since we cannot see what instigates the panic, but we can examine the difference between them. Although obviously, the cows don't have language or reflective consciousness, but it's fun to imagine what they might be saying if they did. Cows as characters within, with human reactive qualities. We've noticed that not all of our herd are in a panic. Uh, at the bottom right of the picture, you'll see the cow closest to us actually looking at us with a sense of resignation. It would seem that this character, let's call her Bessie, is, evalu is evaluating the situation. Bessie suggests to me that she's seen this all before. Perhaps Bessie is a time binder and has learned from previous events. Bessie occupies a group in the painting we could call the observers. They are not part of the cluster of cows that looks as if it's about to stampede. The herd is at a point of rupture or disintegration, as described by Elias Canetti in Crowds and Power, where he writes, panic is a disintegration of the crowd within the crowd. The individual breaks away and wants to escape from it because the crowd as a whole is endangered, but because he is physically stuck with it, he must attack it. We can see this in the prominent white cow at the centre of the painting who supports Canetti's analysis. Her head is bowed, ready to butt anything in her way. 
she's attempting to break away. She constitutes the force of disintegration, a stark contrast with the black cow at the bottom right that observes. There's a kind of yin and yang dynamic to these two characters. They're opposite in their reactions. So the painting depicts panic as it spread, but as it spreads, but some characteristics are, exper are exper some characters are experiencing the situation differently. The herd is like a social brain, an organism as a whole, where data is transmitted and received. Thinking about this painting as a study of reactions led me to a tool associated with Jess. Of you will be well acquainted with this, but a quick recap might be necessary. In Language in Thought and Action, 1939, Hayakawa uses the example of climbing a ladder to illustrate the relationship between words and the things they represent. It illustrates how, when we use language, we begin from seemingly solid beginnings and progress into abstractions. Hayakawa uses a cow named Bessie as his object of study. He begins by reminding us that Bessie, as with any thing or event, operates at a process level from which we only extrapolate limited data. Hayakawa describes how language leads us further away from this baseline of experience. Each rung of the ladder is a further abstraction from the object or event. For example, the first rung after the process level is the object level where we focus on Bessie. On the next rung, we name her as such. On the level after that, we place her in the class cow. And then the next abstraction is the broader class of livestock, etc. So using the abstraction ladder model to create a semantic chain based upon reactions to the painting, we may come up with something a bit like this. So we begin with cows on the first rung and we see the characters populating the pictorial space. Herd on the second rung, as we notice how similar characters and forms are arranged together. And then from this inference, we could ascend to the notion of the panic within the group that's just about to occur, just occurring. Then, as we scrutinise further, facts of the physical picture may assert themselves. The scene is made up of blobs of colour, which is applied by brush strokes. So we began with cows and we end up with brush strokes. The difference, of course, in this case, is that our abstraction is true. The cows are brush strokes. Evaluating an artwork seems to short circuit the abstraction ladder. I guess this is an advantage that art has over empirical sciences. An abstraction ladder mapping reactions to art will wind and bend all over the place without generating a harmful semantic reaction. We find the ladder best suited to a pragmatic linguistic response and not to an aesthetic situation. So language in thought and action was part And there has been much in the way of cultural transformation since. I'd like to explore how the abstraction ladder is suited to our contemporary experiences of communications environments. Ladders have changed a lot since, since the 1940s. Uh, they were heavy and made of wood, and they're now it's extendable. Do you know how to adjust one. the brightness on a Mac? Oh, so too, our communications yeah. environments have drastically changed. Franco Biffo Berardi describes our living within two domains, the social brain and the infosphere. These are characterised by dynamic transmitting and receiving and are fundamentally at odds with each other. In his 2015 book, And Phenomenology of the End, Berardi writes, let's call the infosphere the universe of transmitters and the social brain, the universe of receivers. The universe of receivers is not formatted accordingly to the standards of digital transmitters. 
Although the neural system is highly plastic and can mutate to the rhythm of the infosphere, the format of the transmitter does not correspond to the format of the receiver. So what happens? As the electronic universe of transmission interfaces with the organic world of reception, it is producing pathological effects. Panic, overexcitement, hyperactivity, attention deficit disorders, dyslexia, information overload, and the saturation of neural activity. Ladders can be precarious structures and placed against this environment, there are adjustments the ladder may need to make. Berardi describes our epoch as one of semiotic proliferation and finds a link between our semantic environment and a well-known phenomena in economics. He describes our transactions of symbols are prone to a process of inflation. He states, in, a in the lexicon of economics, inflation means that a greater amount of money purchases less goods. Similarly, semiotic inflation implies that more and more signs purchase less and less meaning. Semiotic inflation can be described as an excess of signs overwhelming conscious attention until it ruptures the link between sign and referent. So we can see how a diagnosis of ruptures between sign and referent could affect the, the abstraction ladder. As we climb each rung, the ladder shows that we pass into new strata of meaning. In Biffo Berardi's environment, where more signs have less purchasing power for meaning, the abstraction ladder becomes more like Jacob's ladder and expands infinitely against the infosphere. Or, like an Instagram feed, flows with constant updates, none of which have epistemic authority. It may be useful then to add a symbol of perpetuity to Hayakawa's ladder. Hayakawa was well aware of the infinity of characteristics at the process level, but we seem to leave this behind as we ascend up the ladder. The ladder implies travel in one direction, which is inadequate when we lean the ladder up against a non-linear infosphere. We find a symbol that may help us in the Ouroboros, the emblematic serpent of creation myths common to ancient Egypt and Greece. The Ouroboros is depicted as a serpent with its tail in its mouth, suggesting unity of all things, perpetual change and eternal cycles of creation and destruction. The image appears in Egypt around 1600 years BCE, and the Ouroboros became an important Gnostic symbol that spans many cultures in which we find similar images, such as the Mobius strip, the Chinese yin and yang symbol, and the Buddhist wheel of life. We merge this symbol with the ladder to account for more consequential factors in communication. The Ouroboros weaving in and out of Hayakawa's ladder is the infinite flow of the infosphere. The curves of the Ouroboros bend and flex around the rigid structure of the ladder, reaching to the process level and all levels, creating a circuit from every rung of the ladder, working in between the word and the thing. It articulates the all-encompassing dynamic of the infosphere and the social brain and the construction and destruction of meaning. As Berardi explains, meaning can no longer be grasped since we cannot extract from the infinite flow of finite, a finite explanation as a workable tool for social interaction and understanding. At that point, Social order can only be produced by syntactic selectors of meaning and automatic deciders. Semantic interpretation is no longer possible because time is too short. Clutching at meaning is a bit like wrestling a snake. Meaning is, a slip, is slippery. Methods of identification struggle to keep up with semiotic inflation as it coils around us.
Being a symbol of continual rebirth, the Ouroboros expresses frailty of identity as a foundation of meaning. It is the symbol of infinite identity, the antithesis of it is what it is type thinking and other such epistemological cop-outs. We find with our playful addition of this symbol, we highlight the more serious note that our environments have changed and our tools need to change with them. The relevance of systems like general semantics and higher cows abstraction ladder are evidenced by their ability to make us aware of the disunity between our changing environments and our ability to evaluate with them. Our, their efficacy lies in the ability of these systems to help us abstract healthily in the present. Here, I've only made a modest, vastly inadequate effort to suggest recalibration of one such tool. Whether these methodologies are seen as archaic or anachronistic is up to us, but they remain truly humanistic, time-binding gifts that encourage us to engage with the world rather than to panic. Thank you.